Now, I've got to get the last part hooked up and we are good to go. And actually, I, I only have one slide today. It's a slide that Randy designed and it is such a good slide to me that it, it has to be um, shown. If I can bring it up here. Okay, so our opening scripture that was read this morning came from the book of Isaiah. And I just want to reread that this morning to start things off. Um, so open your Bible with me to Isaiah chapter 61. When you're there, could you say amen? amen. Very good. Now, just... Set your Bible down for a moment in your lap or something, and let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we can be together. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with such an opportunity to be a part of a great celebration today. And um, Lord, we pray that as we look into your word here, that your Holy Spirit will give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And Lord, we just want to give our attention to you and commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10. And it says here, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has done what? He has clothed me with the garments of salvation, and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and a bride adorns herself with jewels. So here we have a depiction of being clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters, this is the garment that you want to be wearing. Amen? This is the garment that you want to be wearing on judgment day. On judgment day, you don't want to be caught in your own garments. You want to be caught, not caught, you want to be found in the garment that Christ gives you, the garment of his own righteousness, so that when God looks at you, when you are looked at, the pure, spotless, wonderful righteousness of Jesus is seen, covering your sins. Amen? So, today, um, we're going to take a look into Matthew chapter 22, and it's going to deal with this very depiction that you see on the screen, the, the wedding supper of the Lamb, as it were. Okay, so let's turn to Matthew chapter 22. All right, and when you're there, would you please say amen? Amen. Very good. I'm going to begin reading right at the beginning, and I'm going to be pausing periodically to make a point. Okay, so in verse 1, it says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Okay, I want to pause right there and ask you a question. He sent out his servants to call who? Who did he call? Who were they calling? They were calling people who were already invited. Isn't that right? By the way... In the Orient, 
This is still a, a practice that is done today. You may have already received and accepted an invitation, but as the event is nearer, they will send a messenger to reinvite you to come again. Okay, so here's, here's the deal. These people have already been called. How have they been called? They have been called by the Old Testament prophets that were sent. The Old Testament prophets that lifted up the, the, the hope that is in Jesus. And they were called then. But now they're being called again. So who are they being called by now at that point? Okay, so a new prophet is on the scene. We've, we've got John the Baptist involved. We've got the disciples of Jesus and Jesus himself making a call. Calling people who are already invited. But it says at the end of that, uh, verse 3, they were not willing to come. Not willing to come. In other words, they rejected the gospel, right? Okay, so now let's take a look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Okay, here's what I want you to realize here. Who is, who is the one who is doing the calling? The Father. And in this case, we're talking about the Father God, right? So clearly, the Father God is, is calling people to come to the wedding feast that he has made ready. And it says that he is again calling them. Remember, the first time that he sent out servants, they were already invited. But they had already rejected the Old Testament prophets, right? Now, they had been re-invited by John the Baptist and by the disciples, and they got, got a rejection as well. But the father humbles himself even further, and he is very disappointed. He's very hurt by what's going on, but he reaches out again, and he makes another invitation. This was done, notice it says in verse 4 that he sent out other servants. This is done after Jesus has been crucified and resurrected. So this is now the third appeal that's being made. So then you've got um, all things were ready. When he says that all things are ready, what does he mean? W what does he mean when he's, the message is to the people who are being invited. He's saying, come to the wedding, all things are ready. What does that mean? Everything is lined up. It's all done. The sacrifice has been made, and, and the time is here. And the time that we are living in, folks, and you should never get hardened to hearing stuff like this. The time that we are living in, biblically, is known as the time of the end. It is, we are living in what the Bible calls the latter days. Amen? Amen? Scholars call it the anatypical day of atonement. Not the type. You know, the, on the day of atonement, remember what was happening? There was a judgment in favor of the saints, but then anyone who, who didn't uh, subscribe to that um, uh, sacrifice that was offered there in favor of the saints, they were cast out of the camp, right? But the day of atonement was a day of judgment. And we now live in the anatypical day of atonement. Because Hebrews says that Jesus is our high priest. Amen? Amen? 
that he lives ever to make intercession for us. And I know, I know so many people have said that once Jesus died on the cross, it was finished. That's it, man. It's all over. My only question to that is, if that is the end of the story, what are we still doing here? There's more to the story. Because when you think about the whole system, when the lamb is sacrificed, remember what happens then is the priest takes that into the holy place. Right? And he sprinkles it there. And on the day of atonement, he goes into the most holy place. Right? Because there's two apartments in that tabernacle. Are, are you tracking with me? Do you understand what we're talking about here? So the deal is, today, you and I are living in the antitypical Day of Atonement. That means the real Day of Atonement. Not one that is symbolic as in the Old Testament model, but the fact that Jesus, the true high priest, is in the true heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place, working the work of atonement to make a judgment in favor of the saints, and he will soon be returning. Because when he cast down his censer and he says, it is finished. Then he will say, let the just be just still and let the filthy be filthy still. And the Bible says that when he returns, his reward is with him to give to every man according to his work. Amen? Amen. So, here we are. All things are ready. Come to the wedding, he appeals again. Look in verse 5. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. They had stuff to do, man. I know you're talking about the gospel message and all this eternal life stuff and everything, but, you know, I got stuff going on. And I'm going to tell you something, friends. It is high time to wake up out of our slumber. We cannot take lightly the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot take lightly the fact that we are living just on the precipice of eternity. What a grave mistake to take that lightly. Look at, look at verse 6 here. Verse 6 says, And the rest seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. You know, for some people, it's, they're not even content with just ignoring the gospel call. They, they want to rise up against it and cause trouble for the people who are trying to propagate the gospel. Oh... These are fearful times we live in. So some made light of it and some seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. Verse 7 says, but when the king, who's the king again? The father, right? When the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, or bands of soldiers, and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Now listen, if he can take care of the ones who are causing the trouble in such a manner that he destroys them, you know that he could have coerced them to come into the wedding feast, right? But that is not his style. God is not about coercion. He is about invitation. And he does make appeals. He appeals to us over and over again, even when we have rejected him. And I, I dare say we're probably all guilty of having rejected him at some point. Verse 8 says, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy. They were not worth. They didn't even, they didn't put any worth on what they were being invited to. 
They did not value what God was offering. And my friends, I, I, I got to tell you that it, it's a scary thing to think about how many people, multitudes of people that are willing to forfeit eternal life for temporal pleasure. And by the way, some people are willing to forfeit eternal life because they are bound and determined to make their own misery. Verse 9 says, Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Wait, both bad and good? Hmm, that's interesting. But don't you know that the Bible teaches that the wheat and the tares grow together? Isn't that true? And they grow together until when? Until the harvest. Now listen, I'm not a farmer and I don't know much about it, plain and straight up, okay? I don't know much about it. But I do know that I had an elder at a previous church that I served who was a farmer. And he said, do you know that early on, those tares look just like the wheat. And you can't tell the difference and, and figure out which is which. And by the time there is a distinguished difference, you can't pull it out because it would hurt the roots of the, of the wheat. So you just have to wait until it's harvest time. So it's a very interesting analogy. So, they invited both bad and good. Um, let's see. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Now, check this out in verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, why did he come in? To see the guests. In other words, there is an investigation taking place. There is a dress code, you know. At a wedding like this, you can't just come in and the scrubs that you were wearing at work. It's not okay. You have to represent. And in fact, in this place, you need to be represented. You need to be provided with the proper attire. So it says, when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. He did not have on a wedding garment, so he must have stood out, right? And why he didn't have a wedding garment, that's, that's what the king was wondering. He said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? How did you come in here without a wedding garment? And you know, did the guy start to explain himself? Make excuses? No. In fact, it says, and he was what? Speechless. I'm going to show you why he was speechless. Keep your finger at Matthew 22 because we're going to come back there. But turn with me over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. When you're there, could you please say amen? Amen. All right, very good. Now we're going to look at verse 19. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be what? Stopped. Stopped. And all the world may become guilty before God. So what is happening in this moment, if we go back to Matthew chapter 22, and he's saying, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? What is happening is he is being seen 
not covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but he is being seen in his own righteousness, which Isaiah tells us is what? Like filthy rags, right? And so he is being seen that way, and there's nothing he can say because he is guilty under the law of God. Isn't that right? And listen, we all are. Our only hope, we have one and the same hope, and his name is Jesus Christ the righteous. And if we will put our trust in him, he will put on us that robe of righteousness. Now, I want you to know something, friends. Grace is an amazing thing. Most people, when I talk about grace, and I ask people what grace is, most informed people will say, grace is unmerited favor. And that's a pretty good answer. It's something that you can't earn. Unmerited favor, right? That's a pretty good answer. But that is not the comprehensive answer of grace. It is true that it is unmerited favor, but grace is also divine influence upon the heart. And so what I want to tell you is this. You cannot just accept the forgiveness of God and then go on behaving in a manner where you're going to corrupt the garments that you're wearing. You see, most people want the forgiveness without a transformation. But God's intent is that he will restore the image of his own son in you. Not just that he will cover you, but that he will permeate you. So, very, very important stuff there. Verse 13 says... Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that doesn't sound good, does it? When people are in the position where they recognize that they have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. How is that, by the way? How does that occur? There's only one way it occurs, and that is that you, are, you have not put your trust in Jesus and yielded to him entirely as your Savior and Lord. So if you have not done that, then you would be found on the outside. You would not be allowed into the wedding feast. Your garments would be unfit to be a part of the wedding feast. And you would be found on the outside. And you can imagine people on the outside weeping and gnashing teeth. I can't believe it. I, I can't believe you got me out here, you know, pointing fingers. And By the way, this is a good brother. I'm just picking on you because you're right there. Yeah, handy. So finally, in verse 14, it says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called. Think about the whole parable. In the beginning, who did he send servants to? People who had already been invited. But they already said no. And then they said no again. So they sent more again and no again. So most of the people, most of the people that, when, when the feast took place, most of the people were outside. Many, many people just never even accepted the invitation. And then within the feast, you had some that had unfit attire. And the ones that were chosen, the ones that were chosen were the ones that bore the image of the Father's Son, the ones who are covered in his robe of righteousness. And remember, that's not just a concealing of my sinful nature. It is, I, I have put my righteousness upon you, and while you take on my righteousness, it is transforming your very character. 
Because friends, do you realize that there is nothing that we are going to take to heaven from this world, right? Not a thing, except what? Except your character. Now, what if you're mean and ornery and rude? Is that going to translate into the heavenly kingdom? My friends, it is not. It needs to be let go. What if you're stingy and selfish? No, that's not okay. God's intention is that you and I will allow him not only to be our savior, but that we will let him be Lord of us and transform us from the inside out. Renew our minds. Give us a heart transplant. Take out this heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. Put his spirit within us and cause us to walk in his statutes. And we will do his judgments and keep them. Amen? Amen. Man, this is what it's all about, friends. I want you to know that today... The commitment that was made by these young people, by Brooke and by Alexis, to me, it's very, very much like a wedding. And you have now covenanted with God, before God. I, I was up here meeting with Alexis last night. We were just kind of getting oriented to the place a little bit. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm kind of nervous. I said, that's okay. He said, you know, God and the holy angels and all the people will be watching. And I said, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. God and the holy angels and all this company of witnesses has bore witness of the fact that you have made a covenant with the living God to walk with him and live with him as his person, to cast off all others and to keep yourself for only him. Amen? Amen. That is so important, and I'm so proud of you for making that choice, and I'm so pleased that I had an opportunity to walk with you through this part of your journey. And listen, um, I'm going to close today's message in a, in a different kind of way. I'm going to tell you, first of all, that God wants you all to be at the wedding feast. And he wants you to be in proper attire. There's a dress code. And I want you to know that if you don't think that you have the right attire, you know, none of my stuff is good enough. I want you to know that you're right. None of your stuff is good enough. But that's okay because the proper attire is provided by Jesus. So, having said all of that, I, I want to take the opportunity just now to um, call forward, um, actually, I need to sign these, baptismal certificates and I'm going to present them to our new members okay so Brooke could you come forward Brooke, today, here is a certificate of your profession of faith. And uh, we also have given you a book entitled The Great Controversy. This book is a book um, about 
actually the last days from the time of the reformers like Luther and uh, Calvin and Zwingli and so forth until the coming of Jesus Christ. It is a marvelous book that focuses on, as the title suggests, the great controversy between Christ and Satan. Okay, that is your gift, and I'd like you to stay here for just a moment. And I'm going to sign Alexis's baptismal certificate. And Alexis, if you would come forward, brother. Um, you heard my explanation of, of the book. And so it is a copy of The Great Controversy and a certificate of baptism for you today. And so now what I want to do is bring you folks together here. And I'm going to have a closing prayer. But today's closing prayer is going to have a special focus on an, an anointing and an outpouring for these two new members. Okay? Would you just bow your heads with me, please? Father, I want to thank you so much for the important, life-changing decisions that have been made today. I know that today, there is a smile on your face because of the decisions that have been made. I know that there is a celebration that is happening in heaven as all of the angels are, are together with you, Lord, rejoicing in the fact that these two have accepted your invitation and that they have allowed you to grant them the proper apparel to be a part of the wedding feast. And I pray, Father, Lord, that as they step forward from this day, I, I pray that you will anoint them in a special way with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that you will help them to um, cultivate your own character, that they will spend quality time with you and recognize more and more their great need of being intimately connected with you. I pray, Father, that they will be living witnesses for you to be like living epistles known and read of all men. And, and Father, I pray that you will fill them with joy. Joy and hope and faith and love. Just give them great gifts, Father. Help them to be connected rightly with your body so that they have fellowship and encouragement and support and so that they can be plugged into ministry through the use of their giftings. And, and Father... I just want to thank you for building up your own family here. And I pray not only for these two, but for myself and all these brothers and sisters in the sound of my voice. Lord, we need you very much. And I pray that you will help us all to totally accept your invitation. Let you do the work that you want to do in us so that you can do the work you want to do through us. I ask this all now in Jesus' holy name.